There we go. Okay. So thank you very much for having me here today. I really appreciate this. Uh, my talk today will be, as Aristides said, it's on more than just a control variable, age in the workplace and lingering measurement issues. And some of this, um, I, I really, this is something I've been thinking of over the last few years is some measurement issues that are um, hampering or, or slowing down the, um, some of the work we're doing on work and aging. As Aristides mentioned, I'll just go through this very quickly. I, um, done work in the past in public sector uh, selection before becoming a full-time academic. Uh, my research is on applicant reactions, worker stress, uh, applicants' privacy concerns, and more recently, aging workforce. So the overview of the presentation today is why does the aging workforce matter? Then I'll get into what we, we know about some basic things we know about age, individual differences, and worker outcomes. Um, current measurement issues in the aging workforce, which will be the heart of the presentation uh, with age and adverse impact in hiring, um, the questions around subjective age and, or attitude, one's attitudes towards aging, and workability, which is relevant to disability and retirement because uh, it gives a deeper understanding of um, uh, the a deeper understanding of the construct and its measurement is what we need. I want to point out that when I cover these three very different areas of needed research in measurement in age, um, that I'm not focusing on deep psychological measurement issues, but rather from the standpoint of a workplace age researcher who sees some measurement gaps. So that's why the talk is much more at a high level. Um, so first, why is workplace aging important? Uh, first of all, people are living longer lives, and as a result, they're having to work longer to be able to sustain retirement systems. And at the same time, as a society, we want workers to stay healthy and to work successfully if they have to work into later life. Um, what this also means is there's a greater age range of people applying for jobs and a greater age range of people who are working together. Um, so there's a lot of age diversity that we didn't necessarily have before. Now, this also means that there's some um, changes in society <clears throat> that are going on that we need to be aware of. And I'm going to give you a number of statistics here, some of which you may have seen before. But this is first the age dependency ratio, which is the number of people over, over 65, which is retirement age, versus the number of people who are younger and are having to therefore support people who are um, retired. Uh, that would, so the number of people over 65 versus people who are under 65. And where we are in 2010, where we were in 2010 and where we'll be in 2050, and this is according to a study by the European Commission. The light blue lines are the, where 2010, uh, 2050 is the dark blue lines. And you can see that for most countries, the age dependency ratio is actually getting worse, that there are going to be more people over 65 relative to the people who are under 65. Japan is in the worst situation, followed by Germany, Italy, et cetera. Um, but this is a problem facing a lot of industrialized countries is there'll be more, more older people relative to younger. A similar statistic here um, is from um, the US showing where the age was in 1950 versus 2010 versus 2050. You can see here, there are more and more people at that top end, the dark blue, the over 65 relative to the people who are younger. And you can see that the median age of the population has gone up between 1950 and 2010 and is, and is projected to go up even further in 2050. Uh, similar in the EU, this is a very similar stat, and you can see here the, the uh, light shaded part is where things were in 2011, and the dark blue is where things are expected to be in 2060, and it's projected that uh, in Europe there will be many more people in the older age groups than there are now uh, relative to the younger people. And then with this goes the idea that um, age and physical health and disabilities. This is a graph from Cornell and um, Suzanne Briere provided this. It shows that basically the disability prevalence as people age, which is something that we need to keep in mind that people tend to accumulate more disabilities as they age. I think most people knew that, but it, it, it seems as, when, as you get into your 50s, this is when these disabilities begin to accumulate. So what can we do to help support people to continue to work longer and work well? And that's one of the reasons I think think that there's been such an increase in uh, work psychology research 
that's related to um, old aging workforce. And in fact, I can tell you that this is, these are some of the reasons that I became interested in the aging workforce uh, research around 15 years ago. So let me just give you some quick research. So that what I just covered was why this matters, why that there are these demographic changes and how we need to keep, keep people working longer. Here, I'm just going to give a very quick overview um, some basic uh, findings in terms of age and psychology. And uh, these, I think, will uh, form the backbone for some of the other issues I'll talk about later today. Okay, so first of all, some psychological changes within the person. Uh, this is a graph that um, it shows changes in cognitive uh, abilities as people age, starting from youth, which would be under, um, under uh, in their teens, going up through um, old age. And what I have here now, I wanna stop for a moment and say, when I talk about older workers, I generally mean people in their 50s and 60s. There's no agreement on what's meant by an older worker. It really depends on the industry. But um, here you can see that even as, as people um, age, starting from their early 20s, there's some fairly major cognitive changes. If you look at the orange line, um, that's the line for um, fluid intelligence, which is working memory and processing speed. And that's the bad news that you can see from the time that we're in our early 20s that we continue to decline in fluid cognitive abilities. So this will, you know, from, the, from, the, from very early on, it declines. Now, the reason that people argue that this doesn't necessarily lead immediately to declines in performance is because there are increases in crystallized intelligence or wisdom and accumulated job skills. That's the blue line. So that blue line continues to increase uh, throughout most of the life and then sort of starts to peter out uh, in old age, like let's say in the 70s. Now, of course, I want to point out there are huge individual differences in how people age. Some people age much more slowly. Some people lose relatively few of their fluid cognitive abilities. Some it's much steeper. It becomes much more pronounced uh, much later in life. But this is the general trajectory uh, is that uh, fluid intelligence tends to decline and crystallized intelligence tends to increase. So in terms of, that's the, the summary, the quick summary in terms of cognitive changes. Um, there's also personality with age. There may be increases in conscientiousness and agreeableness and decreases in neuroticism and extroversion. So we tend to think of personality as stable throughout adulthood and it basically is, but there are these subtle changes um, that take place. And I can point you to these uh, meta-analyses and large studies by Roberts and colleagues and uh, Soto and colleagues. Okay, there are also age-related changes in job attitudes and performance, but they're, they're kind of interesting. Job attitudes, and these are, I would also say, if you're interested in this topic on job attitudes and performance, some of the most influential recent meta-analyses are by Ingrid Feldman, um, and that's what this, this summarizes here. Age is generally associated in terms of job attitudes with improvements in most job attitudes. They tend to go up as people age. Uh, it might be because of personality changes, but it could also be because people uh, have increased rewards and pay as they age and that their job, they may have changed jobs to get into a job that, that fits them better, but they do seem to be these improvements in attitudes. Performance is really interesting. Um, there seem to be minimal effects of age on task performance, um, or maybe it's curvilinear, but it doesn't seem like it's a strong effect. Uh, and in fact, there are very few effects also on sickness absences with age. So if that's one of your outcomes that you're interested in, there aren't that many differences between older and younger people. Now, the sickness absences, let me stop a moment and point out here that there's some reasons why this could be. That could be due to the fact that we, we have what we call the, uh, the, the healthy worker effect. Um, people who are getting older and are getting sicker and unhealthy tend to drop out of the workforce. And so they're not in our data sets. And that's something that we need to really try to figure out. But the point is that the reason that they think, one reason they think that sickness absences do not seem to show up as a difference between older and younger workers is because many of the sickest older workers have already left the workforce. The other thing to point out with, with performance is that there's slightly high, there's slight improvements in certain performance outcomes with age. People become slightly higher in organizational citizenship behaviors or OCBs, and safety behavior tends to be slightly higher in older workers. And again, there are any number of reasons for why this is, but I want to also add for a lot of these changes related to work, 
we don't exactly know what the mechanism is. We don't know what the mediating mechanisms are. So that's something that we're also trying to figure out within the aging workforce literature. I mean, a, a simple explanation for let's say OCBs and safety behavior is if people's conscientiousness is going up as they age, well, then maybe that's explaining why the OCBs and the safety behavior goes up, but we don't really know that for sure. Next would be age and motivation. And one thing to point out here is that people as they age are not necessarily less motivated, but differently motivated. Um, there are changes in work motivation as people gain and lose abilities, skills, and knowledge. So as people gain skills or, or lose skills, they tend to adjust uh, what they're motivated by. And a lot of this can be explained by lifespan development theories. Uh, an example of this would be socio-emotional selectivity theory uh, by Carstensen. But the point is that people adjust their, their it's, it's actually the, an adaptive thing to change what your, your motives are at work, depending on what your abilities and skills and interests are. What also seems to happen as people age, starting around in their 40s uh, and middle age, is something called generativity motives seem to increase, uh, which is giving back to the next generation. And um, they, you know, this is not absolutely certain, but it seems to be the, the case that as, a per, as people age, around, around middle age, generativity seems to increase, and that might uh, cause people to be motivated by mentoring and, and activities like that. One of the, but one, one of the key things that's been found, which is, uh, drives a lot of uh, research on aging at work, is that uh, there are increased <clears throat> intrinsic work motives <clears throat> and decreased extrinsic work motives as people age. They become more interested in um, the work itself, um, uh, you know, they're interested in uh, enriched work. They're, uh, they're interested in meaningful work, uh, strong personal relationships at work. This seems to be one of the things that comes with aging is a focus on uh, good personal relationships and decrease, there's a decreased interest in things like pay and advancement and promotion as people age. Uh, if you're interested in this work, uh, there've been a number of large um, studies on this, but in particular, I would point you to Doreen Coy's 2011 meta-analysis on this that shows the um, the, uh, the changes in work motives as people age. Okay, and just one last topic to mention here that this is again, the, the summary of the aging workforce literature, very, very quick summary, is that um, there's age stereotyping research. You know, most age stereotypes favor younger workers um, that most older workers, but the thing is that most of the negative stereotypes about older workers are not true. Again, this was another meta-analysis by Ng and Feldman published in Personnel Psychology in 2012, uh, showing that most of the older work, worker stereotypes are not true. In fact, one of the only stereotypes that they um, found may be true is that older workers may prefer, they may not be motivated, uh, may, not, may not be motivated to gain increased training. Um, and that's actually considered to be adaptive. The idea being that if you're at the very end of your career, you're probably not interested in learning a new skill that you may not be able to apply for long, whereas it has much more use for an, a younger worker. Um, the other thing to point out here is that age stereotypes seem to be changing. They're not always favorable to younger workers. And in fact, we're finding in some of our research that there seems to be this negative stereotype against younger workers or millennials. And um, th this is something that we're really wanting to try to, to actually, the, it, within the aging workforce literature, the general conclusion is that thinking in terms of generations is probably not a useful construct. We're better off thinking in terms of age, developmental trajectory, experiences people have, but the concept of a generation is not necessarily useful. It's sort of a, it's a very crude measure and doesn't really uh, help that much. Um, the other thing to point out here in this age stereotyping literature is that there are both explicit and implicit stereotypes that people have, ones they're aware of and ones they are not. Um, this is pretty well established within the social psychology literature, uh, but it's also been more recently applied to the, um, into the work psychology literature as well. Um, I've done some work with some uh, of the, my colleagues at the University of Trento on this, but I would also say that some, I would say most of the work in this field has been done by Ava de Roos um, at Ghent, and her, her colleagues have done a, quite a bit of work on in, implicit or uh, unconscious stereotypes. Okay, so that's the my focus on just my quick summary of that research. Um, so let's get now into the, the heart of the discussion. How can aging workforce research benefit from better measurement? 
And I think one of the things to keep in mind here is this is a relatively new field. And so there are measurement gaps. Um, yes, people have been studying the aging workforce for a while, but it hasn't received nearly the attention that it's gotten in the last 10 or 15 years. And for that reason, people are uncovering many um, gaps in this research in terms of measurement. And this is, I think, one of the things that's holding back the area. Uh, I would also say that, you know, historically age has been treated as noise or a control variable and hasn't been a focal variable, but it's actually quite complex. Um, it, it, right, it, so as a measure, it's simply the, the time since a person's birth until the present time, but it actually contains a number of, of, of other issues. And um, age and the variables associated with age are important for work and the measurement play, may play a significant role. So I, I, I hear some, here's some observations I've had about these. Um, so the three examples I'll give today are very different examples of, of measurement issues. One is age and possible adverse impact and selection measures. Uh, the second is on subjective age, and I'll explain what subjective age is and how, and the issue is really what is subjective age and how to measure it. It's a very uh, popular, it's very, you'll see, you'll see it come up in the, in the popular press fairly often. Uh, and I think the general public finds it very interesting, but what is this measure when you try to use it? And then there is an area that I'm most interested in, which is workability. Um, I wanna point out that there are uh, many other measurement issues besides these three I'm talking about today. These are just three that I'm, I'm focused on. And there is actually an upcoming special issue at work aging and retirement on uh, measurement of um, measurement issues and aging. So um, I, would, I would suggest you, uh, if you're interested in this, you can, you can check that out. I expect that will be out in 2022. Okay, so here is this, my first topic for today is age and possible adverse impact and selection and also maybe differential validity. And this is based on a paper that I did a few years ago with Gwen Fisher and Lisa Finkelstein. Um, and this was published in Human Resource Management Review. Um, this is, not, we don't have a lot of in, empirical evidence on this, but, and I guess that's why I would call it a gap, but there are reasons to see or to believe that there could be adverse impact on um, selection measures based on age. Uh, so the context, again, is a significant proportion of people are working well into their 60s and 70s, and so we now have age-diverse applicant pools. Um, people who may participate in or be affected by selection practices throughout their lifetimes because they're applying for jobs. People are not moving, or people are moving from job to job, like jobs like they hadn't before. They're not just staying in one job. Um, there's greater age diversity in the workplace now than there was previously. Um, most age discrimination research is focused exclusively on disparate treatment. In other words, intentional discrimination. And there, I list here a couple of meta-analyses if you're interested in that. But there has not been research much on adverse impact or difference, differences, uh, mean differences in age groups on personnel selection tests. Um, and so for that reason, I'm going to talk about we, what we thought in that paper was, well, you know, it's, it's surprising nobody's thought about this. And it's probably just because age is not a, uh, a demographic that people have thought about as much in the past as such as gender or ethnic differences. Um, but we think that there's a reason to, to believe there could be this issue. Um, so, so one of the reasons, the, here are some reasons that we think that this adverse impact and differential validity by age groups is plausible. Um, these are three reasons. One is, as I've already stated, there are mean differences by age in both cognitive and personality assessments. So by, right off the bat from the start, that suggests there could be adverse impact in those measures if they're used for selection or if selection procedures are uh, focus a lot on cognitive ability or uh, personality differences. But at the same time, even though we know there are these differences in these measures by age group, um, at the same time, there are minimal differences in the job performance of older and younger workers or older workers actually perform better. So it seems like if there are greater group differences in the predictors than on the performance outcomes, that could lead to differential validity. And also, we think the potential for this may come up more because applicant pools are becoming more age diverse. So there's even more with greater potential because there's more applicants of older ages. And so the possibility of detecting adverse impact seems to be increasing. So let's talk first about um, some, how just adverse impact. There's fluid 
cognitive abilities, I said, like processing speed declines with age. And Salthouse also has some great research, uh, a great discussion of this about how that may impact performance. This is a, an annual review of psychology um, article that's really terrific if you haven't seen it. Um, and, it but, and, but, and one of the reasons that Salthouse says is that you, your um, cognitive, fluid cognitive ability uh, may decline, but it's compensated for in other ways. And there may be, um, I think this is where it really gets interesting is that even though there are these declines in cognitive ability, performance seems to stay the same. And there are other ways in which people comp compensate for their, their losses in terms of cognitive ability. So, so right off the bat, we've got differences in the predictor and maybe not differences in the criterion. That's cognitive ability. Uh, to the extent that personal, personnel selection procedures are based on personality traits, well, those are considered stable throughout the lifetimes, but they, as I mentioned earlier, they may actually change. Uh, conscientiousness and agreeableness tend to increase with age and extroversion and, and neuroticism tend to go down. At the same time, certain subtraits or facets within the big five personality change at different rates. So that it may be that different um, subtraits or facets of the big five may show greater differences in this way. But there's relatively little empirical IO research um, on this. Uh, there's one article by Klein and colleagues in 2015 that was uh, in JAP, uh, and it did show that there might be adverse impact against uh, on cognitive ability measures against older workers. But beyond that, there isn't a lot of research. Um, as for differential validity, when there, that's when there are differences between subgroups and the correlation between, uh, in the correlation between a test and performance, that would be the, what I mean by differential validity, that it's maybe valid for one group and valid, not valid for another, or there are differences in the validity. Um, one of our, thing, our arguments is that for personnel selection procedures that are high in fluid cognitive ability, uh, things like processing speed, if that declines with age, but performance remains stable, due to a worker's compensating or through experience and increased crystallized cognitive ability, this could lead to age differences in the validity of, of fluid cognitive ability tests. Okay, I'm gonna say that once more because I know that was a lot. Basically, it's, I'm, what we're saying is that if there are these declines in fluid cognitive ability, performance remains stable throughout the lifetime. This could lead to differences in the validity of tests for older and younger people. Again, this is something that really needs to be, to be examined. This is not really, I'm not aware of much research on, in this regard. Um, so for differential validity by age for personality, personality measure might be correlated with performance among younger workers, but less so for older people. As an example, um, age-related changes in goals and motivation, we know those exist through uh, Coy et al's meta-analysis. It might mean that personality characteristics are behaviorally manifested differently for older and younger people. So personality traits may differentially relate to older, to outcomes for older and younger workers. One study that um, I did with Franco Fracaroli and Marilena Bertolino several years ago, we found that as an example, proactive personality was a predictor of training outcomes for younger workers, but they're not older workers. Um, and this, but there's not much research I'm aware of beyond, beyond this. Um, so the idea here is that, you know, there, there could be, adverse impact, there could be differential validity. I think it makes, you can make a very good case that there could be, or it should be examined, whether or not, whether or not it exists in large enough amounts that it matters, I, I don't know, but I think it is worth our checking out. It's something the field really needs to look at. So our research questions on this would be, you know, basically do selection procedures assessing cognitive ability, particularly fluid cognitive ability, have adverse impact against older applicants? Uh, do procedures assessing cognitive ability, particularly fluid cognitive ability, result in age-related differential validity? Um, do personality-based selection procedures show adverse impact against um, different age groups, depending on the personality trait or its subtrait? And do uh, these assessments result in age-related uh, differential validity for older and younger applicants, again, depending on the personality trait and what criterion that we're using? Uh, I want to keep in mind here again these differences if they exist you know I'm not saying they do exist I'm saying that we should be looking at it and I don't know whether how great those um, differences are that's the other thing then and, and the other thing I there's, a, there's any number of moderators to look at here whether it's job type the criterion measure are you talking about predicting task performance are you talking about predicting OCBs but I think there's there's just so much to unpack here 
um, that, that could really be examined. And I think part of this is when you have a fairly age diverse applicant pool. If you don't have a very age diverse applicant pool, if all of you know, most of your applicants are in their 20s, you may not find these kinds of differences. Uh, if you do have an age diverse applicant pool, that may become, that may be when it's an issue. Okay, so these are the research questions I have around applicant, uh, excuse me, around, um, around adverse impact in job applicant pools. Um, okay, let's switch gears. I'm, so I'm gonna go to over three very different areas of, of measurement needs. So that was, that deals with personnel selection. Here's a completely different one, which is the idea of subjective age. And it, it, as I mentioned before, it's become a very popular um, variable in a number of ways, but we just don't know a whole lot about it. Um, and I think that that's something that would, is problematic, you know, if something that we're using to, as a, as a, a area of study, uh, but we're not sure exactly what it is or how to measure it, that's a problem. And I, I think that we need to get to check that out. Okay, so you might be saying, what specifically is subjective age? Usually the way that this is, um, that this is uh, determined is how old a person thinks they feel or look or act. Like you might ask a person how old, maybe just one item for each of those. And you, sometimes you, they use one item measures, which is another issue. So how old do you think that you feel? How old do you think you look is another one? How old do you think that you act? Um, and, and like, how old do I think I behave? And how old do I think I at look, act or behave compared to other people my age? So there's a, as right off before we'll get into this more, you can see there's a lot of measurement sloppiness and inconsistency in the way that this is measured, okay? Um, some of the people who've used these measures, for instance, in the um, uh, IO literature would be uh, Jan Cleveland and Lynn Shore. Um, sometimes uh, this is asked in relation to a person's chronological age or in absolute terms. And they chronological age and subjective age tend to be correlated, which is one of the first issues that we find with this. Um, if chronological age is highly correlated with subjective age, and I've seen studies, in fact, some of my own, where they're correlated 0.8 and 0.9. Um, what, so why is, what's the value of subjective age? If it's, just, if it's just redundant with chronological age. But it's still, you're thinking, well, so you may be thinking, well, why are we people studying this? Um, it's very popular. I don't know how else to say it. It's really popular. People like subjective age. It's intuitively appealing. You know, people think it's, it's almost like it's one of those variables that people think, well, it should work. It should do something. It should be important. Why isn't it important? I'm determined to find out why it's not important. So people keep studying it. Um, there is a special issue on in work aging retirement that uh, Kunzacher and Rudolph uh, did, and edit, they ed were the editors in 2019 that talks about this sort of difficult um, uh, measure, it, but it's intuitively appealing to people, both researchers and the general public find it really, they, I don't know how else to say it, they like it. Um, and you know, you hear these expressions in English, like it's not how old you are, but how old you feel. And you're not, you're only as old as you feel. So people think, you know, it's not just how old you are. It doesn't matter what, when you were born, it matters how old you feel or how old you look or how old you think you are. But it might just be redundant with other variables. I mean, it, it, so for instance, it, it's very, we know it's highly correlated with age. The other concern is, it's, is it just another measure of core self-evaluations, you know, like of self-efficacy and uh, so, so, or just, just general feelings about yourself, which is what Zacher and Rudolph were, were pointing out in their 2018 article. Um, and so, um, so that, that's one of the other, uh, that's some of the, the issues with it is that it's popular, but we're not sure what it is and we're not sure if it's, if it's redundant or not. Um, the potential is that, you know, we could say that subjective age could augment chronological age as a measure. Maybe it's maybe subjective age is capturing something that chronological age doesn't get by itself, right? Like maybe this is going a little bit beyond chronological age. Um, so it may tell us something beyond about how individual per, an individual person is aging, perhaps cognitively or, cognitively or emotionally, how they feel about themselves aging. Um, does it, it may explain additional variance beyond chronological, chronological age, just to, even just a little bit. Um, and it might in, predict employee outcomes about, um, a, about uh, things like uh, uh, health and well-being beyond chronological age and some of these other measures. But that's the potential. We don't know that that's necessarily true, but we just think that that's the possibility. Um, so someone answered questions about subjective age. 
Uh, and as you can tell by the way I'm presenting this, I think there are a lot of them. We don't really know, we, don't, we need to know more about it. Um, I, one of them that, that I think is really interesting is it a state or a trait? Is it your identity? Is it stable? Is it dynamic? Um, we, there's not a lot of work on this, but generally it is at least partly dynamic. Um, there are fluctuations in individuals' subjective age that may be affected by their daily mood, stress, or health, or perceptions of their health. And in relation to work, there was a study that showed that subjective age fluctuates due to work events, that if you've had a really bad day, you may suddenly feel older. Um, and this is a, and one of the things to also point out here, this is another very complicated things about subjective age is it, it may be a more meaningful measure only for older people. Right. Uh, let me explain what I mean by that. So if you're 25 and feel like you're 20, I'm not sure that really matters that much. If you're 60 and feel like you're 25, that's probably a big deal. It means you probably feel very good about yourself. And there is some work that shows when older people have a lower subjective age, when older people have a, a, have a slightly younger subjective age about themselves, they tend to have better outcomes. Um, but you can see that it could easily be affected by whether you had a good day or a bad day. And, and, and I mean, I, I, I'm, I, there's so much to disentangle here. I, 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 could have, I could have an entire talk only on subjective age. Um, um, you know, what factors might affect it with, you know, things like maybe your health, your sleep at night, the events at work and at home, coworkers uh, support successes and failures at work. And, we need to know what are the, some of the possible outcomes like retirement, engagement, performance, and well-being. Um, and also then how to measure it, which is the other thing that comes up here. Categorical subjective age, like basically you, some measures just simply ask you, do you feel young, middle-aged, or older, period? Well, how do I describe myself? Young, middle-aged, or older, which is really sort of crude. Or is it an absolute age? Like how old do I feel relative to my age? Or how old do I feel relative to other people my age? Or how, I mean, things, how old do I look and act compared to other people my age? And all of these are probably getting at slightly different things, which is why another reason why uh, Zacher and Rudolph developed a multi-dimensional subjective age measure. Um, and there are, that they found that some, each dimension had different correlates, which isn't surprising. But again, this is just a first step and we really, don't know a lot about how to measure subjective age. So we need to know more about what it is, what its nomological network is, and how to, how to measure it. And I think one of the things that would be easy to say, and I've kind of thought this before myself, it's easy to dismiss subjective age and just say, okay, there's nothing really there. Let's just stick to the variables we know. We know core self-evaluations are important. We know age is important. We know uh, self-efficacy is important. Let's just stick with that. But I think the issue is that subjective age isn't going away. People will continue to talk about it. So we might as well dig in and see what it really is and how best to measure it. Okay, this last section, this last third topic is one I've become particularly interested in lately, excuse me, which is workability. And some of you may be familiar with this variable. Um, it, it's only really only come into um, the organizational psychology research in maybe the last 10, 15 years. It, it, it has its roots in the medical literature and has been used there. Uh, it was uh, developed in the occupational health, excuse me, the occupational medicine literature in Finland originally starting in the 1980s. But we need to, and it's, it seems like a, one of the things I like about workability is that it seems like a, what a friend of mine calls a magic variable. And what I mean by that, the reason it's magic is that it predicts a lot of things. It's like LMX or, or fairness. It, it, it predicts a lot of other big things. And workability seems to be really good at predicting things like a person's well-being, their disability, their, their intentions to go on retirement and their actual retirement. But we need to know much more about what it is. And part of that comes from the fact that it was developed by in the medical literature and not in the psychology literature. I mean, I'm a little, I guess I'm a little biased in that way, but you'll see what I'm talking about in a second. So the concept was first um, developed in the occupational medicine literature. Ilmarinen uh, is the one who's associated, associated with this. It started in the late 80s in Finland. Um, there, there's a Finnish research institute that has used this for that, tons of great data showing 
over time, how workability predicts later turnover, later retirement, later disability, and that it's a good um, signal as to what might be coming in a worker's life. But basically, so what is it? The basic definition is it's one's ability or perceptions of one's ability to meet the psychological, physical, and interpersonal demands of the job. And so basically it's the interplay of the person and the job. It's not just how I feel, but how do I feel in relation to the job I'm doing? And what I, what's been, was great is that it's shown um, to be related to several key outcomes, including health, disability, motivation, retirement intentions, and job performance. And as you'll see in a meta-analysis that we published last year, we have some really compelling findings that it's a great predictor of these. And that's, you know, we, we, we were really excited about that. Okay. But it started out in the occupational medicine literature. So how is it measured? Well, the main measure that's used or has been used until fairly recently is the workability index or the WAI. It comes out of, again, the occupational medicine literature used for over three decades for its ability to predict disability and retirement. Again, some of the research that comes, uh, has come out of Finland in this and out of the medical literature is really compelling about it. This measure has a subjective component and an objective or health component. So the subjective component asks the person, how do they feel about their workability? How, how well are they meeting their current job demands? And the objective component asks them some very specific, specific physical health questions like, um, you know, how things about uh, maybe uh, diabetes or whether they have asthma or whether they have some joint pain, have they had serious illnesses like cancer or heart problems or stroke or high blood pressure in it? tallies all those together and combines that with the subjective component to come up with a workability score, the workability index. The, the issue with this is that it's a, it seems to be a good variable. I, I have to give credit for that, but it's relatively long and cumbersome. So it's not easy to use on a survey. And there's unclear psychometric characteristics. I mean, it just wasn't developed by psychologists or people who are measurement experts. So the factor structure, I'm not quite even sure what it is. At the same time, it, it's a good predictor. It seems to, this workability index is a good predictor of important outcomes like disability and retirement. Now, this is what was done up until maybe uh, in the medical literature, the WAI is like the gold standard. And it's, you'll see it now that you, if you look for it, you'll see quite a bit of research on it, the workability index. Um, but now, you know, one of the things that's coming happening more and more is we're focusing on a slightly different approach to measuring workability, which is perceived workability. And this has happened as workability has been introduced into the organizational psychology literature. Um, and the most common perceived workability measure is probably the one by McGonigal, which was published in 2016 in uh, JAP. And it's four, it's simply, it's actually simply four items. How, what about your current workability compared to your lifetime best? Like how am I doing compared to a few years ago? Workability in relation to your physical demands, mental demands, and your personal demands. It's a fairly, again, the factor structure here is it's sort of a conglomeration of, um, of very different things, but it has, the measure has good internal consistency and it's very good internal consistency. And the other thing is it's short, it's easy to use. It's a four item measure you can drop into a survey. Some people have even used, like I know there's a study several years ago that I think Hannah Soccer was, was on that had only two items and it still seemed to be a, a good, a good um, um, <clears throat> measure. So that's, so that's that we have WAI and we have perceived workability. So it, when it, in the organizational, organizational sciences, generally when we thought of a theoretical model that goes with this, the job demands resources model seems to be what fits it best, the JDR, um, that job resources facilitate, facilitate uh, goal achievement or reduce demands. And so conceptually, a balance of resources and demands can, is a good way to think about perceived workability in the organizational sciences. But you know, we still don't exactly know what workability is. Is it different from other things like self-efficacy or self-esteem? And one of the other practical things we want to know is, is this are these easy subjective age measures comparable to the WAI? Like, are we, you know, are we, you know, since these are the two main ways that, that workability is measured, are you getting the same results from them? So we did this uh, conducted meta-analysis and I want to thank my colleagues here, um, Grant Brady, Dave Cadiz, Jennifer Rainier, Dave Cochran, and Todd Bodner. These are people that are former colleagues and or former students of mine 
uh, some of them from Portland State University. Grant Brady, actually the first author did this as part of his PhD dissertation at Portland State. Um, and what we did was this meta-analysis and we wanted to see what were the workability's nomological network, like the antecedents and outcomes, how much incremental validity um, the workability has compared to similar measures like self-efficacy, which that's another argument is people say, well, workability, isn't that just self-efficacy? Well, yeah, so we wanted to look at that. We looked at uh, studies in the psychology business and management literature and medical literature. Um, and so we, it's a number of, of we, we did a very, very broad um, research review. And we also wanted to compare the workability index with perceived workability for predicting outcomes, like which is better. Um, some of the findings were that um, as we were expecting the physical demands of the job, mental and emotional demands and things like workplace mistreatment were related to lower uh, workability and job resources like um, structural resources and personal resources like social support, fair treatment, uh, just treatment, per, per, a person's mental health, self-efficacy, these were all related to um, workability. And the outcomes were really pretty exciting. We found it was related to job performance, work motivation, job attitudes, exit intentions, and actual exit behaviors like uh, absence, retirement, and disability status were all related to um, workability. Um, strain, and this happened even after controlling for age and health. And workability, again, this is really helpful because this is one of the reasons that so many people are using workability in the organizational sciences is that you're hoping that it relates to these factors. And it is also related to age, that people's workability tends to go down as they continue to age or get into their very late careers. But so this is good, these are good outcomes. Uh, just to show you briefly here, here's the model from the, uh, the article, uh, nice relationships with the antecedents. And I'm, this is a very broad um, summary of the meta-analytic findings. There are actually many more detailed findings within the paper that show very specific relationships with measures of demands and resources. Uh, like for instance, one of the things that we found is a, as a resource, it's a big, a big one is support has fairly from the supervisor and coworkers. That's really good to know. That's a really good predictor of work, a person's workability. If you have if you have supportive supervisors and workers, and at those um, resources actually like support, I think we're around 0.4. They're pretty strong. Um, Health-based resources and of course age is a, had actually only had this. It was related, but not as strongly as you might expect. It was a fairly, uh, but it was a but it was a real um, effect. Um, for the job attitudes, again, we found these nice relationships with attitudes and performance including actual exit behaviors. You know, that was a pretty good predictor of whether a person would leave, actually quit their work later or, or decided to retire. Um, we also looked at the uh, actual type of measure used as a moderator and found very few differences. So that was good. And occupation type, we, it was inconclusive. Um, so in, in the additional findings then would be workability predicted um, <clears throat> additional variance in well-being and engagement and performance over and above um, job self-efficacy, general self-efficacy, and perceived fit. Okay, that was a big finding for us because it felt like workability is different from those things. People would often argue, isn't that just the same as self-efficacy? Well, it predicted above self-efficacy, um, you know, important outcomes like well-being, engagement, and performance above self-efficacy. Um, we looked at whether the effects might be moderated by occupational type. That was not so clear. But what was clear to us was that Perceived workability, which is the short measure, seems to have um, a nearly as good predictive value as the WAI, which is the longer uh, measure used uh, de that developed in the medical literature. N not surprisingly, the, the, each of these is, has slightly different relationships to different outcomes, um, but both of them were very were, were robust measures of workability, or they both were good predictors, which suggests that the nice, shorter perceived workability measures um, seem to be uh, just as useful as the more as the longer, more cumbersome measures. Um, so, so okay, so what? Uh, so, workability it can be used as a barometer to assess and maintain a happy and healthy and productive, engaged workforce. <clears throat> that we found that maybe that you know one of the things that's reducing demands and providing greater support for um, uh, employees is in a way to increase workability. And um, assessment of workability is important to support workforce planning. But so now what is as far as the needed research are, we still need to really understand what workability is in greater detail, even like so we, so we know it's 
not self-efficacy, it's more than self-efficacy, but what, what exactly is it? We need to integrate it within the lifespan development theory, which it really makes sense if we're going to use it in the aging workforce literature. And that actually is what I'm working on right now. Um, this is uh, with some work I've done with colleagues, uh, with some of the same colleagues with the meta-analysis and also some graduate students at the University of Limerick. Um, for instance, we found that there, you maybe really could have three dimensions of workability that are separate, physical, emotional, and interpersonal. They also, they seem to have different relationships with different outcomes. Some are better at predicting satisfaction, engagement, and self-efficacy. And they seem to be, th these, these three measures together seem to be predicting over and above the broader unidimensional workability index. So in terms of, of these measures, we think that we can probably refine these even more to better understand uh, what workability is and how to use it most effectively to understand things like turnover um, health and, and uh, how use it within the aging workforce literature. So in conclusion, um, the, you know, there are some diverse measurement questions and issues related to the aging workforce. The ones I've mentioned today are very, these are very obviously very different uh, topics. I already talked about age and adverse impact, not a subject of age, like what it is and how to measure it. And then the last topic obviously was workability and we need to further clarify that, but there are many others um, such as uh, we see in, and I, I would say that we, you'll see in this upcoming issue of work, aging and retirement, this, this upcoming um, special issue coming out next year on measurement issues. Uh, so if you're interested in this, I would uh, stay tuned and check out uh, work, aging and retirement. And in any case, you know, since I would just want to conclude by saying, you know, we have such a new field of studying aging workforce and for that reason, I think we do have these gaps in, the, in our literature um, that if we can fill these gaps, we'll, we'll be able to do better research. And, and um, that I really would like to, I hope that we can, we can push this along. So thank you very much. I wanna see if you have any, um, any questions and uh, I really appreciate being able to present today. So good afternoon.